Good evening, I'm Carolyn Cass and I'd like to welcome you all today and thank you for joining us to our webinar this evening, which will examine the role of diet in polycystic kidney disease. Our guest presenter is Dr. Kelly Lambert, who is an advanced accredited practicing dietitian who has more than two decades of experience as a specialist renal dietitian. She has qualifications in knowledge translation, health economics and management, and a doctorate investigating health literacy and cognitive impairment in end stage renal disease. Kelly's research is targeted at supporting people with kidney disease to live better lives and improving patient education by health professionals for patients. Kelly is also the author of the recently released Delicious Quick and Easy Kidney Friendly Recipes which is an online free cookbook that shows families who are faced with kidney disease, how they can incorporate healthy eating into their daily lives. And now please welcome Dr. Kelly Lambert. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, thank you for the lovely introduction and welcome to everybody. Um, I'm speaking from Darable country tonight. So thank you for the lovely welcome. welcome. Uh, uh, I'm going to share my screen now and start the presentation proper. So um, I'm glad we had uh, quite a lot of interest this evening about um, this particular seminar because I find there's a lot of misinformation around the place regarding what people with PKD should eat. So hopefully I'll address some of those concerns and questions that you may have. Um, tonight's objectives are to discuss the latest recommendations about diet and PKD. And hopefully during that process, we will debunk some of the common myths that there are around and misconceptions about diet. And hopefully you'll have a clear path ahead. Um, what I would like you to walk away with are some practical um, tips about how you can improve your food choices. And I'll make sure that there's um, sufficient time left to answer any of the questions that you have regarding diet and hopefully uh, put your mind at rest. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I wanted to um, provide a diagram with you to kind of help you understand where my head is at as a dietitian. So when I see a person that has polycystic kidney disease, there's kind of two tracks in my mind about what we need to manipulate in order to improve their health. And on one side of the equation, we've got um, nutrients that might help slow progression. So things like water and salt and protein. And on the other side, some of the nutrients that we need to manipulate are things like the acid load, potassium and phosphate and oxalate. Now, those things are often um, things we address in conjunction with any other diseases that you may have or conditions that you have and any other biochemistry. So blood test results that might be abnormal. Now, the problem is that particular diagram is talking about nutrients and not food and people eat food. So what I'm hoping tonight is that you'll understand why some of the recommendations regarding the food choices are made and you'll walk away with some improved knowledge about those food choices. But I also wanted to spend some time talking about some of the things that I've seen around um, about diet and PKD, because I think there's a lot of um, information that's overhyped at this stage. And, and I'll give you my perspective as a dietitian about where we're at. So from my perspective, um, I would suggest that you get a pen and paper ready so that you can make some notes, maybe some comments that you want to follow up on in terms of questions. And I've got at the end of the presentation, some um, web links for where you can follow up and get some more information. Now, before I start the presentation proper, I just wanted to discuss this particular slide with you. And it's a very important slide that you've probably not really had explained to you before. And what this slide highlights is that there's a hierarchy when it comes to scientific evidence. And we use that hierarchy to guide our decisions about dietary changes. So at the bottom of the hierarchy are animal studies, then we've got observational studies. So these are studies where we just observe outcomes, particular things that happen to people that might have polycystic kidney disease, for example. And then we've got intervention studies. So this is where we divide people into groups and we give one group an intervention and then the other group, we don't give that intervention and we see what happens. And as you move up that evidence hierarchy, 
the relevance to the real life nutrition decisions actually improves. So what I'm going to be using tonight are words like interventions and observational studies. And I want you to understand where they fit in that evidence hierarchy and why perhaps we haven't maybe made suggestions about certain things when it comes to food and diet about PKD. So let's start at the start. What are the things that you can do at this point in time to help slow the progression of PKD? I want you to have a look at this diagram. It's a very simplified diagram of what is a very, very complex process. And what this diagram shows is a simplified version of what happens. So there's some kind of trigger that triggers cyst formation in people who have the genetic mutations for polycystic kidney disease. And then we have accumulation of fluid within that cyst, and then it ends up with the growth of the cyst. So that's a very simplified process. And when I'm talking about some of the nutrients and foods tonight, I'm going to be referring to some of these parts of the process. So where does water fit? Well, water sits at the top of our recommendations, and it's probably not new to you because some of you were involved in the um, study that's been run from here in Australia that was uh, the topic of our last PKD Australia webinar. So just to recap why water is so important for people with PKD. So when you don't drink enough fluid and you have um, a state of dehydration, it stimulates your body to produce vasopressin, which is a hormone. And that's a hormone that's released in the brain in the hypothalamus region. That vasopressin hormone release is what triggers cyst formation and accumulation of fluid and the cyst growth. So the theory is that by increasing the amount of fluid that you drink, you actually stop that vasopressin release from being uh, secreted and therefore you slow down cyst formation, fluid accumulation and cyst growth. And the PREVENT AD PKD trial that was um, conducted by Professor Rangan here in Australia was a very important trial because it was actually testing the theory about if you had somebody who was drinking a very individualised amount of water each day, did that have different outcomes compared to people who drank what we were considered to be a high water intake? And what we found in that trial was that there was no difference in terms of cyst growth between that very individualised advice compared to just recommending high water intake. So what that means is that the general advice to drink a large amount of water each day is still important. Um, there was a little limitation with that study though, and that is that the PKD uh, community are very good at listening to doctors' recommendations, and many of them were already drinking a very large amount of water, more than the Australian population to start with. So there may have been more dramatic results if people were drinking what the general Australian population tends to drink. Nonetheless, water is still very important. The next question that follows obviously on from that was, well, how much should I drink then if the advice of having it individualised no longer necessarily applies? Well, the answer is there is still some need to double check that with your doctor. And that's um, because if your kidney function has declined, the amount of water that you need to drink needs to be adjusted downwards because you no longer have the capacity to excrete that extra water. So double check with your doctor to be doubly sure. But a general rule would be to drink to thirst. So that means when you're thirsty, drink. And if you're not thirsty, don't drink. Um, or have a look at the colour of your urine and make sure it's nice and clear. But just to reinforce, for those of you that do have reduced kidney function, you may need in the later stages of kidney disease to actually stop drinking three litres of fluid a day and actually commence a fluid restriction. And when I say restriction, it may be at at uh, some point in time as low as around one litre per day. And if you were to drink lots of fluid at that point in time, that would cause lots of um, problems with a condition called fluid overload. So there is still some rationale to having individualised advice, but we don't necessarily need you to be testing your urine and having regular checks to give you that individualised advice about fluid. So why is water so important? Why are we not recommending other drinks necessarily? And that's because water intake is one of those things that's directly related to changes in the vasopressin concentration. And there's another really important reason, and that is because water is free of all the other components that come with eating food and, and um, that can affect the concentration of your urine and can increase um, the solute load 
and can cause kidney stones. So water is a great fluid because it doesn't impact those kinds of things. So the next question I often get is, I'm just so sick of drinking water. Can I drink other fluids? And the answer is definitely yes. We do prefer water, but if you're sick of that, um, my suggestion would be to actually add a little bit of lemon juice to your fluids. So around 85 mils per 1000 mils of water, for example, would be all that you really need. So um, the rationale for recommending citrate, uh, uh, sorry, lemon juice is because it actually provides citrate. And citrate has been shown in people with polycystic kidney um, to be something that's deficient. And if you add extra citrate to your diet in the form of lemon juice or other citrus uh, fruits, then you're actually stopping um, kidney stones from forming within the kidneys. Now, I would give a word of warning here about other fluids such as fruit juice and smoothies and milk drinks and cola. And the reason for that is if your kidney disease um, has progressed to the point that you've developed chronic kidney disease, then things like fruit juice and smoothies and milk drinks can actually increase the amount of potassium and phosphate that you're drinking. And that's a major problem because those um, nutrients accumulate and cause major problems in people that have got chronic kidney disease in the middle to later stages. We also don't recommend cola drinks because there's lots of phosphoric acid in cola drinks. So it doesn't matter whether it's Coke or Pepsi, it's cola drinks in general and the phosphoric acid that's a problem. We definitely don't want you to be drinking those. And other sugar sweetened drinks are generally a problem because they contain lots of extra calories. And we know that maintaining our weight is really important for people with poly, um, PKD. So we don't need all those extra calories that come from soft drinks and cordials. Hopefully that's useful for people. What about caffeine? Well, there has been a little bit of research that's been conducted in rat studies. So remember that hierarchy of evidence that we were talking about before. And in those rat studies, what they showed is that caffeine was um, associated with an increased in cyst size. But there's never been any human studies to actually test this in people with PKD. So because of this, we actually think it's sensible just to recommend to people to limit their caffeine amount to what we would recommend for the general population. And that is about four cups of tea or two cups of coffee. Or if you're not a tea or coffee drinker, that would be somewhere in the order of maybe three to four um, cola drinks a day. But as I said before, we don't want you drinking cola drinks. So you don't have to avoid caffeine containing drinks. We just want you to limit the amount to about 200 milligrams a day or four cups of tea and two cups of coffee. The stronger the coffee, the, the less cups you can have of it. So moving on to the other nutrient that we know affects progression of PKD and that is salt. So salt has a number of different mechanisms by which it makes PKD worse. We know that it automatically increases the concentration of sodium in the blood and the immediate reaction of your body to an increase in the concentration of sodium in the blood is that it will cause fluid retention and that's a problem. It also causes an increase in blood pressure and we know that people with PKD suffer from um, high blood pressure generally. And it also, as an additional mechanism, stimulates vasopressin again. So it, it therefore stimulates cyst growth and that's independent of water. So that's why we recommend to people with PKD to have a diet that is reduced in salt. Now, a lot of people have said to me um, during my professional life, I don't add much salt to my foods. Um, I don't cook with salt. So do I really need to reduce the amount of salt that I eat? And the answer will be probably yes. And that is because about 80% of the salt that we get in our diets as Australians actually comes from packaged foods. And the big culprits are things like breads, processed meats, biscuits, sauces, and condiments. And I'm going to show you tonight some examples of how we can make some really smart swaps. Now, I'm not saying you necessarily need to cut out bread. That's not my message at all. What I'm suggesting is that we make some smart swaps or bread choices. So we know from the last Australian Health Survey that the current amount of salt that Australians eat is nine grams, and we recommend five grams a day. Now, the problem is that's really hard to measure. I don't know how many grams of salt I consume in a day. Um, and so we're kind of talking in, 
in, in language that doesn't make any sense to people. But let me tell you this fact, which is based on human studies. So just reducing your salt by one gram a day, so from down from nine grams down to eight grams a day, resulted in a significant retardation of cyst growth. So if you were able to reduce your salt by two grams or three grams or even four grams, you're going to get a massive impact in a positive way on your cyst growth. We also know from some very interesting human studies that for those who take tovaptin, and they also follow a reduced salt diet, it actually helps improve your tolerance. And what I mean by that is that you actually excrete less urine. So you'd have less trips to the toilet. So that's another good reason if you're struggling with tovaptin and having to take lots of trips to the loo. So there's two general principles I want you to take away tonight in regards to salt. The first one is, how do you read a food label? So by law in Australia and New Zealand, all food packages have to have this nutrition information panel. And the only thing I really want you to pay attention to is the per 100 grams column. And the general rule of thumb is that in order to be considered a low salt product by law, it has to have less than 120 milligrams per 100 grams. So in this food label that I've constructed here, it shows that the sodium per 100 grams is 280 milligrams. So it technically couldn't be considered a low sodium product. But this nutrition information panel is the key thing that you should use if you want to compare between products and you're not quite sure because it's using the same metric to compare between things. The other key message I want you to take away is in regards to this one gram a day salt reduction that I just talked about, when we are looking at food packages and the nutrition information panel, one gram of salt is about 400 milligrams of sodium. So if you were able to reduce the amount of sodium by 400 milligrams in one product, and you chose one that was 400 milligrams less, you've automatically reduced your sodium by as your salt by one gram per day already, just from that um, particular change. So let me give you some practical examples here. So I've just got um, three different types of wraps here. They're a popular thing that people often have for lunch now. Um, and probably traditionally we would have said, oh, I'll go for the, the one in the middle there, it's high fiber. Um, but I'm going to show you why that might not be the best choice. So if we have a look at these packages here, starting from the left, each wrap contains 587 milligrams for the ones in the blue packet on the left. If you go for the one in the middle, which is the high fiber version, it's actually more sodium, 639 milligrams. So that's quite a lot of um, sodium. But if you chose this green packet on the far right hand side, look at the difference in sodium you've got there. So you've already saved yourself nearly one gram of salt per day just from making a smart switch there. And coincidentally, this version actually also has an extra five grams of fiber. So it's even better for you from another nutrient perspective, which is it's lower in sodium and it's higher in fiber. So those kind of detective kind of comparisons that you can do can really save you a lot of sodium per day. Let's try another one. So um, this is some different types of condiments here. So tomato sauce is ubiquitous. It's in all different Australian households, I would imagine. And in our household, fountain is the one that we use. But I wanna show you the differences in the sodium content here. So if we look at the one that's used in our house, um, which is the fountain one on the far left-hand side, it's only got 85 milligrams per teaspoon. If we were to choose the one in the middle, um, it's actually got 200 milligrams of sodium. So by choosing um, the one that has 109, sorry, the one that has 85 milligrams per serve, I've actually saved myself 119 milligrams of sodium again. So these kinds of smart salt swaps actually add up and can cumulatively um, uh, reduce your daily salt intake by a lot. Hopefully that makes sense to people. Um, some people actually really like this kind of getting into the nitty gritty of the nuts and bolts of um, 
what they eat. And if you were interested, there is one Australian app on the market that I do recommend. It was one that I um, was partly involved in the development of, um, but I don't get paid or anything for that. I'm doing it as a love job. Um, and that's called the Easy Diet Diary. And the reason I recommend this app over other apps is because the food composition data is Australian unlike any other app that's available to us on the Australian app market, they actually use American food databases, which are not um, directly translatable. So what you can do with this particular app is you could log a, log a day's food intake, for example, um, and work out how much salt you're actually consuming in a day. You can also have a comparison of the different sodium content of different foods. And if you enable the renal options, which is just in the uh, kind of the settings tab. You can also have a look at potassium and phosphate as well if you're interested in, and you need to modify those particular nutrients. The other thing I'm often um, uh, told by people that I see is that um, I don't use salt, but I use pink salt or I use rock salt or I use whatever. Unfortunately, they're all still salt and they all contribute to your sodium intake. So I wouldn't be recommending any of those things. And in fact, there are some salt substitutes on the market that I would advise you to please, please stay away from. And these are the ones on the screen here. And the reason that I'm recommending that you stay away from these is because they actually contain potassium chloride instead of sodium chloride. And for people that have challenges with their kidney function, that potassium can accumulate and can cause um, heart arrhythmias and a heart attack. So it's potentially fatal, particularly if you've got chronic kidney disease that's progressed quite far. So they're not safe for people who have kidney disease. Just avoid them completely. What could you do instead? Well, here's some of the suggestions that um, I would recommend. So sumac is a, a berry, a dried berry that you can find in the Middle East and they grind it up and it's got a beautiful lemony kind of salty taste that you can add to foods instead of salt. Um, I find it's got a really nice flavour and I add it to the top of baked chicken and I often marinate it with some olive oil and some other spices when I'm cooking different meats. And it gives the, the food some flavour but without the salt. I also have a number of um, spice mixes that I've made up with my son and we have them in the cupboard and I've included a few of those in that cookbook that Carolyn mentioned earlier. There's also some places around the, um, the traps online in Australia that you can buy some really, really good quality spices. And this is one of them that I do recommend. So Herbie's is an online spice shop. For those of you that live in Sydney, they have a, a shop front and they actually produce a substitute called Zolt. And it's a, a, a kind of a condiment that you can use instead of salt when you're adding it to things like barbecue chicken or marinades and that kind of thing. And it's really delicious and it would be a good substitute if you wanted to to things and you could try this instead. Okay, so we've talked briefly about the, the things that we can manipulate to slow progression um, and we'll move on to the other side of things shortly. But before we do that, you're probably thinking, what about protein? Why didn't Kelly talk about protein? And there's two reasons for that. Um, but before we move on to what those reasons are, what, why am I worrying about protein? Well, because when you eat protein, it gets broken down into amino acids and those amino acids um, actually contribute to what we would call the osmolar load. And that's the combination of all the different um, kind of elements in the blood. And they also increase the acidity of your blood. And overall, that makes your kidneys work much harder. And if you've already got trouble with your kidney function, you don't want to increase the workload of your kidneys by having lots of protein. We also know from animal-based studies and in other studies of people without PKD that animal-based protein is a problem. And in the PKD-related studies, it showed that animal-based protein increases cyst growth more rapidly and there's a more rapid decline in kidney function compared to if you chose plant-based proteins. So there is some signalling from the literature that it's better to reduce the amount of animal-based protein. It's also better for the environment too. So do I need to be vegan? No, the answer is you don't need to be. We use the term plant-based diets very loosely now to just refer to a diet where you eat less meat, uh, you might eat less fish, less chicken, and maybe a few more meals a week that are totally meat-free. 
Um, so increasing the frequency of meals that you eat that have a plant-based source of protein, like having legumes or tofu or just seeds on top of something or nuts or soybeans, as well as generally increasing the amount of fruit and veggies that you eat is perfect. You don't need to be vegan. You just need to be making a conscious decision to reduce the portion size of meat, chicken and fish. Eggs and cheese are also particularly potent when it comes to protein. So they have just as much of an impact on your acid load and the amount that needs to be filtered by the kidneys as meat, chicken and fish. And what about keto diets? This is very popular um, amongst people with PKD. They've certainly got some good media going about these particular diets, but let me give you my take on this. So keto diets are just a, an abbreviated form that's referring to ketogenic diets. And there is now a range of ketogenic diet prescriptions. So, so when I trained as a dietitian, it was generally a prescription that had super high amounts of fat. Uh, it was high in protein and it was very low in carbohydrate. But since that time, uh, and it was prescribed for kids with epilepsy. But since that time, we've actually kind of broadened out the scope of that diet. And it now refers to a whole range of diet prescriptions that are high in fat. And by doing so, we actually can, trig uh, can trigger a, a process called ketosis in the body. So just let me show you what I mean by, by keto diet. So a lot of you will be familiar with the, the Renew program, which is a um, program that started in the United States for people with PKD. Um, they follow a keto plant-based diet. And if we think about all the calories that we eat in a day, 70 to 75% of calories in that particular program would be coming from fat. A very, very, very small amount of carbohydrate is eaten and a small amount of protein is eaten. If we compare that kind of breakdown to what we would recommend in um, our nutrient recommendations here in Australia, it's around 35% or less fat, 45 to 65% carbohydrate. So there's quite a difference there and around 15 to 25% protein. So the major differences are in the amount of fat that's prescribed and the amount of carbohydrate that's eaten. And that poses lots of problems and there's no human data yet that demonstrates that a keto diet is better for people with PKD. There's been lots of animal studies, but they're problematic. So in the animal studies and in the in vitro studies that have been conducted, what they've shown is that when you deprive um, cyst cells of glucose, then you actually have a change in the way that they work. And that's because cyst cells have an abnormal metabolism. So the theory is if we deprive the cells of glucose, which is what is the form of uh, the basis of carbohydrate foods, um, and by feeding animals in the animal studies a keto diet, they had reduced cyst size, reduced cyst volume. There were some cysts that actually died and there was obviously less progression. But the problem is animal studies don't perfectly replicate what happens in real life with humans. It may be a good representation of what happens metabolically, but the problem is translating this into real life choices. So the people that are the kind of leaders in this field who are running the Renew program have literally uh, in the last few days released um, a publication about what people, the first 20 people on the program actually felt about the program. And overall it was positive, but there were some challenges. Um, and this is what some of them were. So for example, fatigue was still an overwhelming problem and that's because you're depriving your body of glucose and your body has to find another source of energy. Constipation is potentially a problem in these diets if you don't increase the amount of um, plant foods that contain fiber. One of the automatic uh, metabolic reactions that happens on keto diets is you will increase your triglycerides and that's because um, it's very hard to maintain adequate calories in these kinds of diets. So people naturally lose weight 
And by losing weight, you're breaking down the fat stores and that's what puts up your triglycerides. We also had issues with adherence. People can become vitamin deficient on these diets because they don't have adequate vitamins and minerals and you can't meet the nutritional requirements of humans in these diets without supplements. And the problem that I have with this particular program is, is not just that it's hard to stick to in real life, it's that you have to pay $180 a month American for the supplements that they're prescribing. And that's a very huge impost to us people. Uh, especially because you can get some of the ingredients that are in those supplements from food anyway. Some of the other animal studies that have been conducted actually um, have looked at intermittent fasting. So having a few days a week where you have very, very low calories um, or what we call time restricted feeding. So that's where you might have only eight or 10 hours in the day where you're allowed to eat. Um, and if you think about the time period in your day normally now that you would spend eating, it's generally 12 to 14 hours for most people. But in these uh, rat studies in particular, they showed that if you uh, restricted both the amount of time and the amount of calories that you were consuming or the rats were consuming, then there was also slow progression of PKD, less cyst expansion, blah, blah, blah. But the problem is these are rat studies and there's no studies in humans that have proven that they're worth doing in humans yet. There's several underway. But again, we still don't know. So it's too early, in my opinion, to jump to these kinds of diets because we don't actually know if they work. Um, however, there has just been a major study published in one of the most prestigious medical journals in the world that showed it actually didn't matter if you were following intermittent fasting or time-restricted feeding. The fact was people just ate less calories and they both resulted in weight loss. So I think you'll probably find similar results in these studies um, where we're testing them in, in humans with PKD. So at this point in time, we want people to lose weight if they're overweight, but it really, it's not worth trying these diets yet unless you can sustain it for a very long time. So what do you do? Um, seek advice from a dietitian about how to lose weight because there might be some really simple strategies we can put in place to help you cut those calories without making these major, major dietary changes. Um, and what we want you to be able to do is to maintain that weight loss um, over a fairly long period of time because we know that if you can maintain that weight loss for many years, you actually have better outcomes. Okay, so moving on now to managing the side effects. So I'm just going to talk about three of those elements there. So we'll talk about acid load first. So this is where the concept of alkaline diets for PKD come in. So traditionally, when your kidneys don't work, there is a buildup of acid in your blood. And that's because the acid that is a result of eating food doesn't get excreted via the kidneys as efficiently. And one of the traditional therapies that we've used in Australia um, to actually counteract that acidification of the blood is to give people sodium bicarbonate capsules. And many of you may actually be taking these. And it's a really simple trick. It does the job. It does um, increase the alkalinity of the blood and, and kind of reverses temporarily that acidification of the blood. But the problem is it also provides 230 milligrams of sodium per capsule and a typical regimen that you might be on if you're requiring this might be six capsules a day. So you're getting an awful lot of sodium for, um, you know, one of these benefits of counteracting the acidification. So what, what else works? Where's the evidence? <clears throat> Excuse me. So we know that if you reduce the amount of animal protein and you eat more plant protein and you combine that with an increased amount of fruit and veg each day, um, then you'll actually get as an effective um, reversal of the acidification as if you were taking sodium bicarbonate. And we do actually know that some vegetables and fruits are better than others. And let me show you what they are. So everything that I've got on the screen here is a type of fruit that actually provides super, super um, alkalinity and has a, an amazing effect on reversing that acidification of the blood. Now, for those of you that have kidney disease that requires you to follow a low potassium diet, some of these fruits will be problematic because while they might improve the acidification, they do contain a lot of potassium. But a safe bet for everybody at every stage of kidney disease would be the berries in the top left-hand corner. That's not going to be detrimental to anybody. So that would be my one takeaway message tonight. Eat more fruit and veg, particularly the berries. 
when it comes to vegetables, I'll show you the vegetables um, in a minute that are particularly helpful, but these are the two strategies that I've been using in my house to get my kids to eat more vegetables, and they're actually very translatable strategies to people. So having vegetable platters available at the table or readily available in the fridge, as well as I just make up a tray literally like this with a rainbow of different types of veg, and my kids are allowed to choose off the tray which vegetables they want to eat. Um, so I'll show you the vegetables in a second, but I just wanted to, to have a little word here about the, the protein. So as I said before, the animal proteins make more acid. Um, so we don't want you to cut out all animal proteins. You don't have to be vegetarian, but if you did have to make a choice, then choose oily fish first. Um, or if you had to choose red meat, choose lean red meat, including kangaroo, that would be fine. Um, or chicken in small portions. And if you can, and you like them, Choose more vegetarian options. So choose tofu, beans, seeds, and small portions of nuts. And some legumes are better than others. So the ones that are in the circles here are actually legumes that have a, a highly beneficial effect in terms of um, their alkalinity. So if I had to recommend one particular type of legume over others, it would be soybeans or cannellini beans or kidney beans. Lima beans are not so popular here in Australia. And if we're talking about portion size, generally the size of the palm of your hand is what's appropriate for most people. If you're a large male, you'll have a bigger hand and therefore that's about the size you need to follow. Um, it's not including your fingertips and about, it's about as thick as the palm of your hand. So that's a general rule of thumb. So uh, as I said before, when it comes to the uh, accumulation of potassium and phosphorus, that happens when you have kidney disease that has progressed and you're the natural side effect is your body cannot filter those things out effectively. So we want to control those at the later stages because excessive potassium can be fatal and excessive phosphate can cause hardening of blood vessels. So that's really important for us to get those things under control. So my advice is don't start low potassium diets unnecessarily. You only need to start those if you've been given advice by a doctor that you need to or a dietitian. And if you can, seek advice from a dietitian so we can help you balance all of your nutritional priorities. Low potassium diets can be complicated, but people tend to get advice that makes it seem too simple and that's not what we want. For example, we don't want you to cut out all fruit and veg because we know they have an amazing effect on alkalinity. Now, I've just noticed, noticed one of my slides didn't pop up before, but I'll just go back to the vegetables. So the vegetables that have the most positive effect on improving the acidification of your blood, so they have a really amazing alkaline effect, are all brassica vegetables. So what I mean by that are cauliflower, broccoli, um, Brussels sprouts, Kale has, is another good one. Cabbage of any type, purple or green. Those are the vegetables that you should be going to first because they have such an amazing effect on the, the acidity of your blood. If you do have to follow a low potassium diet, then there are some starting points and that would be avoid things like chocolate, coffee, licorice, because they are not nutritious. They are delicious, but they're not nutritious and they provide extra potassium and reduce the amount of meat portion size you have because that also contributes potassium. What about phosphate? Everybody in the world needs to avoid packaged foods, particularly if you have PKD or CKD, because the phosphate additives are highly absorbed and they um, cause lots of problems with our health. So if you were looking for which food numbers you need to avoid, they're the ones on the screen there and they're often really well disguised. So you might need to look carefully at the, the ingredients to actually figure out if you're eating them or not. And if you do need a low phosphate diet, it's more than just avoiding packaged foods. There are some other restrictions that are required, but I'm not going to go through what they are now because it's very individualized. But as a general rule, these would be the sorts of foods where you do get lots of phosphate and phosphate additives, and they might surprise you. So for example, barramundi is an excellent fish. I'm not saying don't eat barramundi, but what you need to be careful of is that this kind of frozen type of barramundi actually has phosphate additives added to it to help as a preservative. And you're accidentally consuming those by buying food in that particular way. Just moving on, because I want to spend time um, on questions shortly. What about kidney stones? This is something else that we need to pay attention to because a large number of people with PKD also develop kidney stones, and especially the types of kidney stones that are made from uric acid and oxalate. 
that the good news is they can be directly managed with diet. So if you have uric acid kidney stones, in addition to drinking lots of water and particularly lemon water, you need to have small portions of animal protein and don't overdo it on the beer because that does increase the uric acid in your blood and therefore will increase the kidney stones. If you have calcium oxalate kidney stones, there's actually a little bit more complicated advice that you need to follow. And that would be, first of all, don't take vitamin C supplements. Don't take large volumes of fruit juice because they contain huge amounts of vitamin C, which actually cause oxalate kidney stones. Avoid some of the high oxalate foods. And if this is you, come and see a dietitian so you can get a sensible list of high oxalate foods. Uh, reduce your salt and make sure you're getting enough calcium. And a dietitian can tell you how much enough calcium is depending on your stage of kidney disease, because that does change. So there is some good news when it comes to kidney stones. And finally, if you do have fluid overload, or you're not even sure you've got fluid overload, but you're showing symptoms like shortness of breath, your feet are swelling, your wedding band doesn't fit, your glasses leave indentations or your socks do, then you actually may need to discuss that with your doctor and they may need to put you on some diuretic medications to get rid of the extra fluid and it's no longer appropriate for you to drink large amounts of fluid. So do check with your doctor if this is happening to you. So in summary, putting it all together, what can you actually do? What can you walk away tonight knowing? The first thing I want you to do is have a conscious uh, choice tomorrow to include two pieces of fruit and five handfuls of veggies every day. Make sure you have a small amount of meat at your main meal. If you're looking at kind of a steak in a supermarket, what you want to know is how much grams you need to have, and it would be about 125 grams but if you wanted to include some plant-based protein, of course, please do that. Don't add salt, drink lots of fluid, but be cautious if you're showing signs of fluid overload. Still inc include lots of delicious whole grain foods and legumes and talk to your dietitian about how much dairy or milk alternatives you should eat because that is individualized depending on your stage of kidney disease. They're not bad foods, but you just need to adjust the amount that you eat of those things. So my next steps for you would be start, start with some smart substitutions to increase your fruit intake. And one of the first things that I've done recently was actually choose to buy some frozen fruits of different um, varieties that I don't eat commonly and I make them into smoothies. Increase the amount of vegetables or vary the types of veggies that you have that you're eating now and maybe go for some more brassicas. And if that's still too overwhelming, then maybe just start working on one meal at a time. Maybe that's improving your breakfast. And then when you've done that, move to lunch and so on. And in terms of where you want to go for more information, uh, most dietitians across Australia that I know who work as renal dietitians would be very happy to have a referral to see you. Um, ask your kidney doctor that you see for a referral to a renal dietitian. Um, have a look at the recipe book for some inspiration. It may not appeal, every recipe may not appeal, but there's some in there surely that would be hopefully helpful for you. Um, and there's two other places that I, I just wanted to make you aware of because they're really good websites that have lots of really good recipes. So the International Society for Renal Nutrition and Metabolism has a website and they've got a section called the Patient Corner. And in that Patient Corner, there's a whole range of recipes from across the world um, that are specifically for people with kidney disease. And the other link that I've shown there is also for a Northwestern United States uh, dialysis unit that actually has some fabulous recipes too. So check those out. And that's uh, just a quick shot of our cookbook that we put together in case you haven't seen it. Please feel free to give us any feedback if you have any, or if you see any errors as well. So I think we might wrap that up there tonight and I'll pass the uh, screen back over to Carolyn so that we can take some questions from the audience. Yeah, thanks so much, Kelly. That was incredibly informative. Um, I know that you would have answered some of the main burning questions that a lot of our viewers would have had. Uh, we do have some additional questions that have come through in advance. So I might just um, 
and ask those questions to you first. Mm -hmm. And then quite a few questions have come through tonight. So we'll get through as many as we can. I think I have around 10. Mm -hmm. um, we'll see how we go um, in finishing up. And Kelly will also be um, putting together a frequently asked questions slide sheet that we can pop up on our website and for the questions that we have here tonight also. So let's dive into those. And um, the first one is, if animal protein is harder for the kidneys to process, then why do almost all recipes have animal protein as the main component of the meal? Um, this is from someone who says he's not a vegan, but doing what he can to preserve his kidney function. I think that's just tradition. I think in Australia, we have the meat as the main sort of focus of the meal. Um, and we just need to readjust our thinking about what makes a meal now, I think. Um, and we know more now in terms of the science of how food is metabolised. So I think that's probably why. We just didn't know all those years ago. Yeah. Okay. Having downloaded a copy of your recipe book, I note that many of the recipes still use margarine as shortening. Why is this? And is there a way of limiting, um, is this a way of limiting dairy? And if so, does butter make that much difference? <laughs> um, two questions in one there. So margarine is generally better for you, and that's because it's lower in saturated fats, unlike butter, which is high in trans and saturated fats, and they're not good for you health-wise. Um, margarine is, is generally what I would prefer to use in cooking if I couldn't use olive oil or some kind of liquid oil. So, for example, I'll give you a practical example. If I'm making brownies, I don't use butter or margarine. I actually use a liquid oil and it turns out just fine. And I actually choose to use an oil that's better for me. Um, it's not a means of um, avoiding dairy by using margarine. It doesn't count as a dairy food as such. Um, it's just used for its cooking properties in those particular recipes where I couldn't use a liquid oil instead. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Great. Thank you for that. Are plant-based diets better or is there too much potassium, oxalate and phosphorus and not enough iron? I know you have touched upon this earlier. Um, many of these recipes are, again, animal protein. So. Yeah, look, plant-based diets, as a general rule, they are better for you. They're healthier for you overall, but there are some challenges to them. So, for example, if you were going to go the full hog and, and become vegan, for example, you cannot meet your vitamin B12 requirements from a vegan diet. If you were not going to go that quite that is extreme, um, then you would need some advice about how you would meet your vitamin B12 requirements if you were choosing to eat less animal products. Um, the other issue that we traditionally thought would be a problem is that plant-based diets, when you look at a food composition table, do contain lots of potassium. But we actually now have science that tells us that the potassium in plant-based diets is not very well absorbed at all. And in fact, we've just finished conducting a clinical trial here in Wollongong with people with um, CKD, quite advanced CKD, who followed a plant-based diet. Um, and we found that it had no impact on their potassium at all. Um, and they actually really enjoyed it, which was fabulous. Um, so as a general rule, plant-based diets are generally better for you. Even if you're only making kind of a, a move towards eating more plants, that's not a bad thing. Yeah. Absolutely. Great. Is there any information on a product available in the US called Keto Citra? I'm not sure yeah. if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, a so-called medical food. And do you have any information on that? Uh, yeah, I do have information on it. So Keto Citra contains two ingredients. One is uh, beta hydroxybutyrate, which is a ketone. Um, and the other thing that it contains is citrate. And the reason that the people who are going through the Renew program are taking that supplement is to help keep them in ketosis. So that's where the beta hydroxybutyrate comes in. And the citrate part is to help with the management of kidney stones. Now, um, as I said before, you can actually get more citrate from just having lemon juice in water. So I actually think that part of it is kind of unnecessary. Um, the BHB part, though, that's still to be determined about whether it's actually beneficial in humans or not. So I would suggest you don't purchase that at this point in time. Uh, perhaps if you were to do the Renew program down the track when they've got some evidence about whether it works or not, then I perhaps would think about it. But it's also very expensive. It's 180 US dollars a month to take this supplement. So please don't feel like you should go ahead and take that. It's, it's not necessary at this point. 
Great. Kelly, when you refer to the effect of cysts of these diets, does this apply equally to liver cysts as well or just kidney cysts? If someone question, has a yeah. disease as well. We, we don't know. We really don't know. There's been no studies to kind of have a look at that even in humans. Um, and when I say there's really been no studies, there literally is. Um, I could count on one hand the number of studies that have been done on this particular Kind of way of eating um, and most of them are not in humans they're in animals so sorry i can't answer that question just yet <laughs> all good <laughs> all right is uh what have we got now what are your thoughts kelly on alkaline water uh don't bother don't waste your money not worth it okay just regular water with some lemon juice or without the lemon juice and just regular water it's fine yeah there we go. And we've also got one on why should we avoid smoothies? Uh, if you have kidney disease that has progressed, uh, smoothies can contain a lot of phosphate from the milk or the milk alternative that you use. And they will definitely contain a lot of potassium from the fruit that you add to it and or if you add protein powder to it. So it might be okay for somebody at earlier stages of PKD and CKD, but for those of you that have already got signs that your kidneys are struggling, I wouldn't go down that path. Now, let me preface that by saying, there are some people with PKD who really struggle with eating and they just can't get enough food in in the day because they get full very quickly. And if that's you, then maybe that could be a strategy to get extra nutrition into you. But again, have a talk with the dietitian to see if it would be appropriate or not. I wouldn't go starting it without some advice first, unfortunately. Great. And talking about dietitians, Kelly, are there different rules per different states in Australia for someone who is wanting, who has PKD, wanting to see a dietitian in terms of having to get a GP's referral? And um, um, generally, yeah. if you're attached to a nephrologist, um, just a referral from a nephrologist should be enough to access a renal dietitian that's attached to renal units as a general rule. Um, if you're accessing a dietitian that's not a renal dietitian, but they might work in private practice, for example, so generally a referral from any medical practitioner would be appropriate. And even sometimes you don't even need to have a referral. You can just go and see them in private practice. The thing that makes it helpful, though, is regardless of who you see, is we really need access to your most recent bloods. So if you can bring that with you to the appointment, it's so helpful to have that in front of us because that really dictates the type of advice we give to you. Whereas if we don't have access to recent blood tests, we're actually guesstimating and we'll err on the side of safety rather than giving you potentially much more individualised advice until we get those blood tests. So to answer your question, no, there's no rules generally that we follow in Australia other than if you're attached to a renal unit, um, then generally that renal dietitian would accept a referral to them. Uh, and if you do have troubles accessing a renal dietitian, I do know some renal dietitians that work in private practice that accept um, telehealth referrals. Um, so if that's somebody in the audience, then please let Carolyn know and I can pass details along. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Kelly. Just a couple more questions here from our audience tonight. Is there a shopping list available for staples that are suitable for kidney diets? No, I've not constructed one of those. Um, because I don't want people to feel like they need to be constrained by it in some ways. I think as a general rule, if you're going to be going to the shops every week, I want you to pick up a punnet of berries of some kind. That's a good starting point or have some frozen berries. If you're going to look at your vegetables, I want you to put the brassicas in there every week. So the cauliflower, the cabbage, the broccoli, the Brussels sprouts, the kale, that should be your starting veg. And then other vegetables should come in after that. Um, when it comes to your meat, I really don't care what you have, as long as it's a small portion. And if it's vegetable based protein, same thing. Be, um, be free with them and have some variety. Um, yeah, so no, there's no shopping list that I've got handy for you. I think it's about learning some general principles and then adapting and having some flexibility. Okay, and the last one here, what are your thoughts on nutritional yeast, savoury flakes and coconut aminos? 
<laughs> they taste delicious. I use nutritional yeast, not for the vitamin properties, but for uh, taste principles. Okay. Um, <laughs> and, and there's a lot of stuff around in the internet about nutritional yeast as a source of vitamin B12, but um, we actually think it's not that effective. So for those of you that don't know what nutritional yeast is, um, it's actually a byproduct of um, a bacteria that's used to make uh, beer. Um, and it does contain some vitamin B12 when we look at it from a food composition perspective, but we think it's inactivated, so it's not very useful. Um, so if you do have a vitamin B12 deficiency or you're taking it because you think you're at risk of developing one, it's probably more effective to have something like, uh, if you're a vegetarian, enriched soy milk with vitamin B12 in it and have that instead. If you want to take it for the flavour, go for it. Now, the coconut aminos are another thing that they're not any better than anything else, except for maybe the bottle is lower in sodium than soy sauce. Uh, it's got a slightly different taste. So go for it if you like it, but it's not better than anything else. Yeah. I've noticed it is quite low in sodium. So in mm. that respect, um, it could help instead of soy sauce. But, exactly. um, but the flavor is, is, is quite nice as well. Mm. But um, yeah, no option there. Okay, now that's all we have at the moment. Oh, that was great timing, yes, wasn't it? We managed to get through everything at eight o'clock on the dot. <laughs> that worked out really well. Did you have anything else that you'd like to add in tonight, this evening, Kelly? Uh, no, I don't, but I, I do welcome people's feedback if they have questions that are still lingering afterwards or if they have feedback on the cookbook or whatever. Like I, I know people are struggling to navigate this in Australia, so... Uh, I do hope that this webinar has been helpful for you um, and good luck and good health to you all. <laughs> Wonderful. So thank you once again, Kelly. It was so super informative. As always, a pleasure to have you with us. You've got so much uh, to give and to offer. And if anyone has any questions about what Kelly has spoken about tonight or her cookbook, you can reach out to Kelly via PKG Australia, send us an email. We'll put you in touch with Kelly or reach out directly to Kelly herself. And a recorded version of this webinar will also be available on our YouTube uh, channel on our website shortly. And thank you once again to everyone for attending tonight. And Kelly Lambert, thank you once again. And oh, if you'd like to receive PKD Australia's monthly newsletters featuring all the latest news and information, please head to www.pkdaustralia.org. Org. Um, or for Kelly's cookbook link, you can find that on our newsletters or on our Facebook link. Um, again, please feel free to reach out to us directly and we can send you the link also. So thank you once again for joining us tonight. We look forward to seeing you again soon and we hope the information was super helpful to you. Thanks again. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>